$50 per semester. That is only for non-remedial courses. If your student is registered for a remedial course, Millennium will not cover that. So it will pay the $80 per credit for however many credits are non-remedial. For those who are out of state residents, if you're in one of our um, WUI schools, so it's the states that are surrounding um, right around Nevada, we extend what's called the Western Undergraduate Student Exchange Program. Um, and it's a discount program. So this is different than other awards that you see because most financial aid will show up on a financial aid award letter. The WUI is different because it operates like a discount program. So you're not gonna see it on that, on that award letter. Your student will receive an email if it's extended to them, offering them that award. Um, if they are offered it, where you see the award show up will be on their bill. So here, you see a non-resident WUI tuition. So non-resident fee is normally $69.55. Because this student was awarded the WUI, they're paying the $15.32. So big, big discount. Um, it's not a flat fee, it's a percentage. Uh, so everyone's WUI discount will look different depending on the number of courses, um, the types of fees associated with their courses, and um, how much their program costs. So everyone's um, tuition amount discount will be different. A lot of students will do a comparison of, my friend got Louie and they only paid X amount of dollars. Why am I paying a rate that's higher? You're probably in more expensive classes, more classes, there's a reason, because it's not a flat fee, it is a percentage. In the communication center on the student's My UNLV account, um, if you get into that center, you can access their financial aid award notification. I like these notifications because you can print them out, you can take it with you. It breaks the award down for each semester. I'm a visual person. I understand that it says 5730 and that's what I'm getting for the academic year, but I like to see how much am I getting for fall, how much am I getting for spring. And that's what this um, award notification does. It breaks it out and shows exactly how much you're getting per semester. Underneath, you see the cost of attendance. So this is not an actual cost. So this student it isn't really going to cost them $15,000 to come here. It's an estimate. We take into consideration all the factors that you see here um, that go into being a student. And with that cost of attendance, it just lets us know in our office the maximum amount of financial aid we can award your student. Um, so you'll see that their cost of attendance and their offer, they match. So financial aid in your bill. Um, I talked a little bit earlier about that to-do list. Anything on the to-do list will keep your aid from paying out. So if there's a verification worksheet on there and it hasn't been completed, the aid will not pay. Um, if your student has already received um, their award letter and they've accepted loans, and it's the first time that they've accepted loans, what will show up on their to-do list is a please sign a master promissory note and please complete um, loan entrance counseling. If they don't check that list and they never do those items, then their aid will not pay out. If they've completed everything, their aid will turn into anticipated aid and then it will turn into actual aid 10 days prior to the start of the semester. So this year, their aid will become actual aid on August 15th. That is the time that we will take that um, financial aid and apply it towards their tuition and fees. There's nothing that the student needs to do to um, prompt us to pay off their bill. Um, if they have aid and everything is set to go by the 15th, we will automatically send those funds to the cashier's office. Um, if there is money left over, um, then the cashier's office will generate a refund for the student. If there's still money that is due, then you are responsible for paying the amount that's due by the 22nd. After the 22nd, you will begin to accrue late fees. And I believe it's $25 a day, and it caps out, I think, at $250. Um, you do have an option of signing up for a payment plan, so if you have looked at your student's financial aid award package, you realize it's not gonna be enough to cover the full cost of um, all of their classes or room and board, then you can sign up for a payment plan. It's, um, your bill is broken into four equal installments. Um, you can sign
kind of using your my UNLV student center. So this student, um, the tuition and fees were 5,200, their financial aid was 7,200, so they have a $2,000 refund. Um, most students use those refunds to help pay for books. Um, if they need a new laptop, they just need some cash in their pockets because they're gonna be hungry when they're on campus all day. Um, so that, that money goes back to the student. The only time it does not go back to the student is if this refund is because of a parent plus loan. We know that's a loan that you would have taken out as a parent. You have an option of deciding where that money goes. You can opt to have it go directly to your student or you can choose to have that money come directly to you. But if you have chosen it to go to your student, your student can sign up for a direct deposit. That's the fastest way to receive those funds. Um, the slowest way, of course, is a paper check, because that has to go through the mail. Here's a challenge with the paper checks. So the students are responsible for keeping their address updated on their MyUNLV account. But unfortunately, that doesn't always happen. They move, they forget to change that update. If they have a financial aid refund that has come to them, it is going to whatever address they have on file on their MyUNLV account. If it was the wrong one, then that check is potentially lost. They're gonna have to come into the cashier's office, get a stop payment on the check, get it reissued. It's gonna get mailed out again, now to your the student's new address. If the student was counting on that refund money to pay for books, it's probably not gonna come in time for that. So if your student has a direct deposit, um, a bank account, I would encourage them to sign up for direct deposit. If you used a credit card at some point in time to make payments um, to your student's account, there is a possibility that the refund can be put back on a credit card. That's another option as well. So the census day is the last day to change um, anything with the student's account. So August 29th is the Friday after school starts. That is our lock-in day for financial aid. So meaning if your student is only in nine credits, and they're still trying to figure out how to get into another class so they can be full time, but they don't do it by this date, the financial aid that they have will be locked into nine credits. So if they're Pell Grant eligible, they're not going to receive the full amount of the Pell Grant that they could have received because they were not in 12 credits. They're only gonna receive the Pell Grant that's associated with being in nine credits. But if they had a class after this date, we cannot pay any federal aid to help pay for that. So satisfactory academic progress. The federal government has particular standards that they require students to meet in order to continue to receive federal aid in any form, even if it's loans that the student is going to pay back. So they must maintain a 2.0 GPA, cumulative. If they fall below a 2.0 um, GPA, the first time they'll get a warning. If they remain below the 2.0 for the next um, consecutive semester, then they will sit, receive a disqualification saying you're no longer eligible for federal aid. So same with the completion rate. So completion rate is a little bit harder to understand. So here's how I explain it. Your student starts off their first semester, they're taking five classes, which is 15 credits. They decide, whoa, college is much harder than I expected it to be. So they drop a class and now they're in 12 credits out of the original 15 that they started with. They do not do well on their final and they are not going to pass the class. So now they've only successfully completed nine out of the 15 credits that they started with. They are already at a 60% completion rate. They will receive a notice from us after their first semester saying, you are on warning. If you do not bring up your completion rate after the next semester, you will be disqualified from federal aid. So it can happen that quickly. So it's important to understand how dropping classes and failing classes completes um, affects that completion rate. The last thing is this 186 credit hours. Seems like a lot of credits, but if your student is anything like I was when I started college, I had no idea what I wanted to be, and I was changing majors and trying out things, everything under the sun, and not talking to an academic advisor, just kind of taking random classes as I go, like, oh, this class sounds fun, I'm just gonna take it. Not really working towards a degree. Your student does that enough, it is very easy to approach this 186 and not be ready to graduate. So it's important to have conversations with your students about 
changing majors multiple times, adding and dropping minors, adding and dropping majors, double major, double major and a minor. There's so many different combinations that students may go through, but all of those decisions impact their eligibility for federal aid. So if your student does get into one of these positions where they're not meeting one or more of these standards, all hope is not lost. There is an appeal process that they can go to. Um, they'll write a letter, they'll explain what has led them to be in that position. That will go to a committee and a committee will make a decision based on that letter and any supporting documentation whether or not to extend aid to the student even though they're not meeting the qualifications. So if they give you a call and they're frantic, um, you know, redirect them back to our office and we will help them um, get the appeal documented. 